Twice. It's supposed to be twice. Or was the practice mold set up for did you try it more than one time? I only tried twice. I only tried one time. Okay. Okay. I think I set it up so you can take twice and you get the highest score. Okay, so is there anybody else in here that needs a copy of the syllabus that was not here on Monday? Has everybody had the opportunity to uh, log into their Canvas account? How many people have taken the practice? Is it going to work okay? You could do it twice. Records the highest score. For the practice quiz, though, remember that as long as you do it, I'm going to go in and give everybody the full credits for that practice quiz. I'm not going to do that for the other quiz. Okay, so are there any questions before we get started? So we're going to finish up on chapter one in your textbook, and then we're going to move on to chapter two, which has to do with chemistry. So remember that one of the characteristics of all of living organisms is, is that they have to acquire energy from their environment. And remember that some of that energy could be in the form of chemicals. And um, when it's very interesting because when we look at the physical property of energy transformations, we say something that's really interesting. And that is, is, is that as you go from one type of energy to another, um, you will lose energy in the form of heat. And so when we talk about, say, for example, going from um, ATP, which is kind of the it's a molecule, we'll talk about what it is, but it's a molecule that has a lot of energy stored in it. And when we break ATP down and we use muscle contractions, for example, so we use ATP to produce movements. So this type of energy is what is called chemical energy. And we can store it. And then we can use that chemical energy to produce mechanical energy in the case of movement. So when we can go from one form of energy to another, it is inefficient. So we lose energy, and that energy is lost as heat. So you can see um, in an ecosystem, the ultimate form of energy in most ecosystems is the sun. And when we capture or when plants capture sunlight, only a little bit of that energy gets converted into their growth and their reproduction. So notice this is not a diagram we have, but this is solar energy. So these are the plants that are capturing solar energy and producing sugars. So they're capturing energy and converting it, um, that solar energy into chemical energy, and they're growing, and they're developing, and they're reproducing. But notice that energy is lost as heat. And then we've all experienced energy being lost as heat, because when we run, for example, or when we walk or we move, we produce heat that is lost across the surface of our body. And so that is energy that is lost to our environment that we can't recapture, right? And so here you can see the, um, the rabbit eats that stored energy in the plants, but it then loses some of that energy as heat 
You know, it only uses so much energy to maintain its body, to grow, to reproduce. And so what we find is a relationship in and between levels in an ecosystem that is called the ecological pyramid. So it's called the ecological pyramid. And this shows the amount of stored energy at each level of an ecosystem. So, for example, we could have an ecological pyramid where at the base we have a very large block, right? So this, what this is showing is the amount of energy in the biomass. So it would be like the biomass of the organisms that are this level of the base of the pyramid. And so these are organisms like plants, right? So they capture sunlight, and they can store a lot of energy. Then as we move up the pyramid, the blocks get smaller, which means there's less stored energy. So where did all of this stored energy go, right? That was here, and then these guys eat it. It was lost as heat, right? So here we would have, for example, herbivores. So these could be organisms that only eat plants, like perhaps deer or, or cows, right? And then we have a smaller one, right? And so these could be, for example, carnivores. So giving an example from an aquatic ecosystem, the ocean, um, we can see, actually this is not the ocean, that's freshwater. I'm going to use the ocean one. We could say, for example, this could be the algae, right? This could be um, uh, zooplankton. So that could be like small crustaceans like shrimp. So that would be like shrimp, for example, right? Krill. K-R-I-L, right? And this could be whales. Now, only some whales, specifically the baby whales, feed upon small crustaceans. So krill and these really small ones that are called plankton. Plankton are things that float around in the ocean. And so there's big masses of them at different places. They tend to aggregate in one area. And so a large whale that is a baby whale would come through and just open its mouth and scoop up the water, and then in its gills, it would catch these small, tiny organisms, okay? So the question is, um, when we look at the ocean, are there, uh, and the biomass, is there more biomass in the krill or in the whales? In the krill, even though they're tiny, right? And that's the way it has to be, so that if you deplete, the krill and the other zooplankton in the ocean, then you have to decrease the size of the carnivores that feed upon it, right? And so um, that's a really important principle, is, is that the way that our ecological pyramids are set up is, is that you cannot have um, a, a greater mass, a greater amount of energy at the top. Okay? So generally it's not like you would have a big block on top. So if you put like humans up here, you know, with the population, it might be bigger than say, for example, the mass of the whales. And if we just chose to only eat whales, that would be um, an uh, um, a, a ecological pyramid that would not work, okay? So we also do have decomposition. So sometimes you see this. So this is decomposition. So bacteria and fungi, for example, can break 
down the remains of a herbivore or a carnivore or even a plant, and then those nutrients can be used by the plants to um, produce their biomass. Now, the way that I drew these levels, um, it actually is uh, more dramatic than that, so that only 10% of energy is transferred, is successfully transferred from one level to another. Right, so 10%, so that means that 90% of the energy is lost to the environment. Okay, so that's why I put in this one from a, um, uh, image from a uh, textbook that shows it looking like this, right? And so 10% of that is um, what is um, successfully moving up. Um, so it's more dramatic. That doesn't actually show 10%, does it? That would be 80. Yeah, so that's a little bit off, but approximately 10%. Okay. Okay, so that's um, talking about energy and energy exchange and energy transformations. And we're actually going to talk, come back to that idea because we're going to talk about energy as it um, exists within atoms and also energy as it exists between molecules. But before I do that, I want to um, talk about the scientific method as it is described in your book. And specifically, I want to talk about the idea of a theory. Okay, so theories in science are not the same thing as an hypothesis. And so it's really um, easy to um, think of theories as being just educated guesses because that's how we use the term theory in our everyday language. So the way that we as everyday say like, oh, I have a theory that if I um, don't, if I don't eat after six o'clock, I will sleep better, right? Because I won't be all like digesting food and I won't get heartburn and that kind of thing. So that's like my theory, right? And um, so actually I should say, if I was being scientifically correct, I should say that I hypothesize that if I don't eat after six o'clock in the evening that I will sleep better, right? So a theory is well tested, right? Okay, so this means that there are multiple lines of evidence. Okay. And so in physics, we have laws. We, in biology, we don't really have many laws, like the law of gravity or the laws of thermodynamics. We have theories. And so if we get some examples of theory, Okay. One example is the cell theory. Okay. So this is a theory that states that all living organisms can consist of cells. Well, we talked about how viruses kind of, kind of are outliers on that one. But the other really interesting thing about cells is, is that they do not spontaneously appear today. So it's kind of interesting, we do not have any new life spontaneously forming. And the reason why they think, the hypothesis for why they think that is the case, is, is that our atmosphere is not conducive. It is very oxidizing. We have lots of oxygen, and oxygen, just like when it reacts with iron and causes rust, oxygen is very oxidizing, and it tends to break molecules apart. So if you say in the ocean, at one point in time, molecules spontaneously came together to form cells, right? And then those cells gave rise to the cells that we have around today. Well, molecules are no longer spontaneously coming together in today's world, right? So there's essentially no new life arising. We are all related to one another, right? 
So this is that living, the cells come from pre-existing cells, we'll put all cells, today come from pre-existing cells. Right, so there's a lineage, a line of inheritance that goes all the way back to single cells, organisms. And that living things are composed of cells. So even though viruses are not composed of cells, they need cells in order to reproduce, right? So a virus needs to get inside of one of my cells and hijack its machinery and cause my cells to produce more viral particles, okay? So that is a theory in biology, right? So that's a huge thing, right? Lots of lines of evidence, um, and it is well tested. So some other examples of theories, okay? Um, one is the theory of homeostasis, okay, so that the internal environment of an organism stays relatively constant. We talked about that as that all living things have order, right, and they have to maintain order. They have to use energy to keep the order um, from going to a state of disorder or increasing in entropy. Um, we also have genes, that organisms have genes. Or ecosystems interact, so that's the um, theories. Evolution, that all things have a common ancestor. And so when we talk about um, theories in biology, it's a big deal. Okay, any questions about that idea that we use theory just differently in everyday language than we do when we're talking about biology? Okay, so we're going to start on chemistry, and so for you, those of you who are really into science fiction, um, what's, um, when they create a life form, what do they sometimes imagine it being based upon instead of carbon? Silicone, excellent, okay. Okay, and so we're going to look at why. Why do they base life on silicon? Silicon, you might know of, is, is glass, right? Um, or glass is made up of that element. Um, and so, why is it that they sometimes hypothesize that that um, is the kind of the building block of life, possible building block of life in other um, universes? Okay. Okay. So we're going to start talking about basic chemistry, and we're going to start at the level of the atom. And we're actually going to look at some of the, the, the characteristics of the atoms and why the atoms um, have a particular um, characteristic. So when we look at atoms, they are made up of subatomic particles. These subatomic particles include protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons and the neutrons are found in the shell, or excuse me, the nucleus. Oops, the nucleus. So I'm gonna put protons and neutrons, and I'm gonna say this is found in the nucleus. Okay, so that's the center of the atom. Now the electrons exist in shells outside the um, nucleus. So these are called shells. And there's different ways of visualizing shells. Some people like to visualize them in, in the diesel to visualize them in different ways depending upon what you're interested in. Some of them visualize it as like a cloud of, of possibilities of where the electron could exist at any given period of time. But when we look at the, how uh, we're going to visualize um, the atoms, they look like this. Okay. So the nucleus is in the center of the atom, has the protons and the neutrons. 
Now, what you'll notice here is, is that the protons think positive. The protons have a positive charge. Neutron think neutral, think that they do not have a charge. And then, residing around right, the nucleus are the electrons, and they have a negative charge. So if we go back to our little um, lecture here. The protons are positively charged. I'll put just a zero for neutrons. And the electrons have a negative charge. Now, in terms of mass, because atoms is what are what make up matter, so they have to have substance. They have to have weight, right? So they have to have mass. And so we say that protons have one unit of atomic mass. Electron or neutrons also have one unit. And then for our purposes, we're going to say that electrons have no mass. And so they are so small that they essentially do not give the atom it ends with any additional weight, just being present. Okay. Now, you might be familiar with atoms because when we look at elements, and specifically the periodic table, these are the elements that we have been able to um, identify and categorize. And um, so these are all of the elements. Not all of these are found in our body, right? So there, we talked about how carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, for example, are common elements that we have inside. So an element is composed of all the same atoms. So sometimes in biology, we kind of use them, uh, the word atom and element um, as the same thing. So for example, we would say that there's carbon um, atom, and we also have the carbon elements. Okay. In chemistry, it's more important to distinguish um, because the carbon elements can exist in different forms, right? So it could be a charcoal, it could be a diamond, right? But it's made of carbon. Okay. So atoms and elements are essentially kind of the, the same thing, okay? So let's look at, um, say, for example, carbon. So carbon has the um, elemental symbol C, that makes sense. And then it has some numbers. Okay. So up top, the left side, this is what is called the atomic number. This is what is called the atomic mass. Now, the atomic number is the number of protein or protons. So this is the number of protons. Okay. So, carbon has six protons, and it has a 12 atomic mass. So how many neutrons do you think it has in it? Six, right? Because we have six protons and six neutrons. This is the common form and the most stable form of carbon, of elemental carbon, right? Now, when we look at it, is there a negative or positive charge associated with the C? Is any positive or negative? No, right? So what that means is, is that the electrons must cancel out the positivity of the protons. So how many electrons do we have? Six, right? So we have six electrons. So this number, these numbers give us a lot of information about what the atom looks like, okay? And so when we look at an atom, back, oh, it's not gonna, okay, I'm gonna do this. So when we look at an atom, this is my nucleus, and this is my first shell, my second shell, 
and my third shell, okay? So this is the nucleus, and these are the electron shells. Now, you probably you might have heard of the, of, of, um, the shells and how many electrons can fit into a shell. So the first shell can only fit two electrons. So that means that the next shell, well actually in this case, the next shell can, can fit eight electrons and the next shell can fit eight electrons, okay? This eight is, and as we go out, there's always eight electrons in each cell, in each shell, excuse me, and this is what is called the octet rule. So this is the shells, if they're completely filled, there's two on the first one, eight, eight, and then eight for forever, right? So if we were to look at carbon, carbon is going to have six total electrons. So it would have two here, and it would have four here. Okay. So my starboard's not, oh, there we go. Okay. So this would be carbon right here. Okay. So we have two electrons and then four electrons. So let's draw that actually in your notes. So this is carbon. The first shell has two electrons. The next shell has four electrons. Okay. Now, there are some um, elements and atoms that um, kind of break that rule. And those are what are called isotopes. Okay. So isotopes are atoms that have the same number of protons. but a different number of neutrons, okay? So C12, right, that has six pro protons and six neutrons versus C14. So we'll put six up here too. Six, six. Okay. So this is carbon 12 and carbon 14. If it has six protons, how many neutrons does it have? <clears throat> Got to equal 14. So 14 minus six is eight, okay? So this one has eight neutrons. So we say that carbon-14 is an isotope of carbon. Now, these um, are not, they're produced in our atmosphere. Carbon-14 is produced in our atmosphere, but it is not very stable. So it breaks down over time. Okay. And the reason why I use carbon um, in this particular instance is this is the basis for carbon unique, okay? So carbon-14 exists in our atmosphere, and we breathe it in, and we incorporate it into our body. But when we die, we, start, we stop getting new carbon-14, and then the carbon-14 starts to break down. And then it breaks down um, at a set rate over a given period of time. And so carbon dating can be used by looking at the relative proportion of carbon in the organism or in the fossil that is found, okay? So this can be used for carbon dating. And I have a little video here that we're gonna watch that explains this in more detail. Let's 
Where's Oops. the reader keeps you safer if you deal cards like this or like this? How do we know how old something is? For people, we ask to see their birth certificate. For trees, we count the rings. But how do we know how old a fossil is? Fossils have their own internal clock. Scientists can read it by looking at the ratio of two different types. Let me see of if I can get this louder. Of course, Sorry. Every living thing is made of carbon. Plants grab carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use it to form complex organic molecules. Animals get their carbon by eating these plants. But there's more than one form of carbon. Most carbon atoms have six protons and six neutrons. We call this carbon 12. High up in the atmosphere, sometimes cosmic rays hit nitrogen atoms. This creates carbon with six protons and eight neutrons. We call this carbon 14. Carbon 12 and carbon 14 behave alike, but carbon 14 has one unique and important attribute. It's unstable. So once an animal dies, the carbon 14 in its body will start to go away. Every 5,730 years on average, about half of the carbon-14 atoms will decay into nitrogen. This is its half-life. After one half-life, the animal will have about half the amount of carbon-14 it started with. After another half-life, it will have about a quarter. And after another half-life, it will have about an eighth. By contrast, the amount of carbon-12 it has in its body will stay the same. By measuring the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, we can measure how many thousands of years have passed since the animal died. Carbon dating works for fossils up to about 60,000 years old. For older fossils, scientists use unstable elements that have much longer half-lives. For Scientific Americans in Seneca, I'm Michael Moyer. Okay, so that's carbon dating. We can also use these radioactive isotopes for other um, purposes. And um, one thing that we can do is, is that we can use them to measure um, the movement of substances in our bodies. So for example, you can use radioactive iodine. So radioactive iodine is an unstable isotope and it's called a radioisotope. You don't want a lot of radioactive iodine in your body, but you can put it in, and then you can watch where it goes. So what part of our body, does anybody know, what gland, what uh, endocrine gland in our body would need or needs iodine in order to produce its stuff? Anybody know? Thyroid? Yes, excellent. So this is, this would travel to the thyroid gland, right? Okay. So we're going to talk about later, when we start talking about molecular biology and molecular genetics, we're going to talk about these radioactive isotopes and how you can tag atoms and then you can watch what they do because them being radioactive means that they emit energy. And so you can follow where they go in the body or inside the cell to determine you know, what, how a chemical reaction um, is taking place, how, how we figure out for example, how, where things go in the body and how fast they get picked up, okay? Okay, so those are isotopes. Now, if we look at the different um, uh, atoms, we can note something about their electrons and also how much energy they hold in their um, electron shells. So let's talk about the energy first. So, if this is positive nucleus, this is the negative electron. Okay, it is kind of like a magnet. These are going to be pulled together, right? Because they're oppositely charged. So the electron, if you have only one electron, is going to want to go towards that that nucleus, right? However, you can actually store energy in an atom. By taking this electron, I'm using a different color. By taking that electron, oops, where are my colors? Right here, maybe. Purple. 
and converting it and moving it away, right? So I can take that electron and I could move it to the next shell. Now, do you think that that is, um, would that be the uh, atom releasing energy or would that be the atom storing energy? If you're taking it and you're moving, so let's say you have two magnets and you move them apart, is that stored energy or is that energy um, being um, uh, emitted? So in this direction, if you move it further away, that's storing energy. Right? Because I'm moving them farther away. So if I have two magnets and I move them away, I now have potential energy, stored energy, because if I let those magnets go, then they're going to come back together, right? And so I'm going to release energy when that happens. And so if it goes the other way, from here to here, right, my electron, then that would be releasing energy. So if an electron is moved further away, so electron moved further from the nucleus. That's stored energy. If the electron moves towards the nucleus, that would be releasing energy. Kinetic energy moves toward nucleus. Okay, and this is actually how plants are able to capture light energy during photosynthesis. So when we look at um, the uh, pigments, right, um, the pigment chlorophyll has atoms in it, and by hitting it, the atoms with sunlight, it actually causes the electrons to move to a different shell, right? And so it stores the energy, and then the plant uses that sort of energy to build um, sugars, to make sugars, right? And so ultimately we have energy that can be stored inside um, a atom, okay? Okay, we can also talk about um, uh, the energy um, and the, um, the different types of elements and atoms. So we'll talk about different types of atoms, okay? So some atoms are reactive. And what this means is, is that they are going to interact with other atoms. And this also has to do with the electron shells. So a reactive atom has its outer orbit not filled. So the outer electron orbit is not filled. Okay. So let's look at hydrogen. Hydrogen has just one proton and it has one electron. So I'll, bring, I'll put a little H in here, that's hydrogen. And so it has one electron. Is it reactive? Is it is its outer orbit filled? How many does the first shell hold? Two, right? So hydrogen, right, is has only one electron, right? So it would like to interact with another atom to give it another electron, or actually would like to give that electron away, okay? So this is reactive. Hydrogen atoms are reactive. What about helium? That's the nucleus, okay? Helium has two electrons, okay? So its outer orbit is filled. And so what we call helium, what do we call helium? Does anybody know? Meaning that meaning that it's not reactive. So non-reactive, reactive means it does not interact. 
with other atoms. Okay. So it's a gas. What kind of gas is it? Noble, right? So this is a noble gas. Noble means that it just does not interact with anything, right? Which is why helium is not an atom that we have in our bodies because it's non-reactive. It would never form molecules by interacting with other atoms. But we have lots of hydrogen, right? We've got glucose, C6, H12, O6, lots of hydrogen. And the reason why is that it is very reactive, okay? So carbon, is carbon reactive or not reactive? I think we already drew this, didn't we? Right? So carbon has two, and then it has four. So is it reactive or not reactive? It is reactive. Because of the octet rule, right? So it has four electrons, but it would like, that's kind of anthropomorphic, but it would be, it, is, it kind of has this propensity to make um, connections with other atoms that would make it more like um, eight, right? So it is reactive. And carbon forms the skeletal basis for all of the organic molecules, from lipids to proteins to carbohydrates to um, to nucleic acids, they're all carbon-based. Okay, so let's look at silica. And I forgot to look up this up, so I'm gonna have to go back to the periodic chart to see what the. Oops, there we go. Okay, so let's find silica on here. I know it's it's little. Okay, so silica. Atomic mass of 14. Okay, so let's go back to our living, oops, or go to our whiteboard. Okay. Silica. We have two electrons. I'm just going to draw two electrons. We have what? Four electrons? Four electrons. And then we have what? Oh, sorry, eight. Ah. Eight. There's 10. We have 14 because silica is 14, 28, right? So we'd have four electrons, okay? So silica is a lot like carbon in its structure in that it has only, the outer shell is only half filled, right? So that's why people that, you know, think about science fiction imagine a world where creatures are made of silica instead of carbon. Okay, so I have kind of a funny video. The music is horrendous, but it's a funny video. It's called Chemical Party, and is people, I don't know if you've seen this, people acting out the different elements and how they interact with one another. So non-reactive and reactive elements. Now, I'll turn the volume down because really... It's hard, kind of, well, there we go, okay. Somebody will really like the, the music probably, huh? So these guys are dressed up as elements and they're behaving similar. I 
Okay. European European Union. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's the fun video showing why elements or atoms interact with one another. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about some interactions between atoms. And this has to do with molecular bonding. So we can talk about molecular bonds. Can everybody see purple? So there are three types, three kinds of molecular bonds, one of which has kind of a, a variation on it. The first one is called ionic. And this is where electrons get transferred between atoms. So a really good example of this is sodium plus chloride. Okay. Now, if you were to find pure sodium, which is not something you normally find, I think maybe they heat manufacture it, and pure elemental chlorine, this is actually a metallic solid. And this is a gas, a yellow gas. Neither of which you would either want to breathe or touch, right? So elemental sodium is, is really dangerous, right? Because it is really reactive and so is chlorine. So that could, um, the chlorine gas could kill you, right? So if we look at the way that they look, here is elemental sodium and elemental chlorine, okay? If we look at their outer orbits, you'll notice that sodium has one electron just hanging out all by itself. So what that means, like, if you touched this, it would try to give you an electron and it would damage you, right? It would, it would burn you up, right? And notice that chlorine has seven electrons in its outer orbit. So applying the octet rule, if you put these two things together, there should be an exchange, right? So what's going to happen is, is that sodium is going to want to give up an electron, this electron right here, and it's going to want to give it to the chloride um, element. And so when you do this, when you put them together, this chemical reaction is very um, uh, strong, right? It's kind of like a little mini miniature bomb going off. It goes right? Those elect, that electron gets exchanged between the elements, right? And so now sodium, so if you go, this is, our, this is what you already wrote down, right? Sodium becomes Na positive, right? So it is positively charged now because it has donated its electrons. Chlorine or chloride is negative, charged right this is table salt they're attracted to one another um, because of the difference in charge so this is a relatively weak bond Um, due to differences, sorry, to do differences in charge. There we go. And you can break that bond or water, actually. They showed water going in and breaking the bond, right? So water can actually come in and break sodium and chloride up, right? And take them into solution. So when you put salt into the water, the salt dissolves and it goes into solution. And you'll no longer be able to see salt crystals because it'll break them up, okay? So that is what is referred to as an ionic bond. Okay. So this is ionic. Okay. It's ionic because sodium and chloride are charged and they're called ions, right? 
So these are called ions because they're charged. Okay, the next type of bond is called a covalent bond. And covalent bond is where we have sharing of electrons between atoms. Right. Now, the sharing of electrons depends upon how strong the nucleus is, which depends upon how many protons are present in the nucleus. So we can have what are called nonpolar covalent bonds, which means that the electrons are sh shared equally. Right. Non-polar covalent. So, for example, oxygen forms two covalent bonds with another oxygen atom. So this is O2. This is oxygen gas that we breathe in and use in cellular respiration. So covalent bonds are drawn with a solid line. And this just means that they're sharing not one electron, but two electrons. Okay. Another example of this would be hydrogen. So this would be hydrogen gas. Right? So because these atoms have the same proton, number of protons in them, they share it equally. They share the electrons equally between them. Okay? This is different for polar covalent. bonds. And this is where the electrons are shared unequally. Okay. So a good example of this is water, and we're going to talk about water in more detail, but water is oxygen, H2O, bound to two hydrogen atoms. So these hydrogen, remember, just have one electron, and they're sharing it with the, with the um, oxygen. Hydrogen only has one proton, so it is weaker than this. So what happens is, is that the oxygen is gonna draw the electrons towards it, and so we get a molecule that is negatively charged here and positively charged here. Right. So those difference in charges mean that it is polar, meaning that the charge is not equally distributed over the entire molecule. So it has, it's polarized, think of that being polarized, the water molecule is. Okay. Now, the other type of, um, and so this is a stronger bond. And you can actually store energy in covalent bonds. So, for example, you could have a chemical that looks like this. Okay. Oops, with an H. Okay. So this is a organic molecule that has three carbons and it has hydrogen. This is actually propane. Okay. So propane is energy stored, right? Method. Yeah, propane. So this is energy stored. And so you know that you can burn propane. And when you burn it, you break apart the bonds between the atoms in this molecule. So for example, if I burned this, I combusted it in the presence of oxygen, then I would get CO2 plus H2O, right? And that's not the same amount of carbon on each side. There's three carbons, so you have to balance the chemical equation. But the important thing is, is that, and plus energy, sorry. 
I ran out of room, plus energy. Okay. So the important thing to realize is, is that I needed to break these carbon, you know, like this could be a fossil fuel, fossil fuels are also long carbon genes. And when I break them and combust them in the presence of oxygen, then it burns and it releases energy. Okay. So what that means is that we have stored energy between atoms, right, in a molecule. And when we break that apart, energy can be released. And that's how the body works too, right? We break down sugar in the presence, glucose in the presence of oxygen to produce energy as well. Okay, the last type of bond. is the hydrogen bond. And the hydrogen bond is a weak bond, like the ionic bond. It can be easily broken. And instead of being shown as a solid line, it is shown as a dotted line. And it is the weak attraction between opposite, oppositely charged molecules or parts of molecules. So there's no exchange of electrons. Oppositive, we'll just put, ah, attraction between different charged parts of a molecule. Okay. Okay, so the hydrogen bond is most infamous in between water molecules. So I'm gonna draw two water molecules and how they would interact. Okay, so if you remember, we talked about how this is positive and this is negative. Hydrogen has a positive charge, negative, and that's due to um, the arrangements of the electrons, here we have a dotted line, right? So notice how there's a, um, a weak attraction between one molecule and another. Within the water molecule, it's pretty strong attraction, right? So imagine that you have a pot of water and you're boiling it and you're producing steam. When you put energy into the water to boil it, what bond are you breaking? Are you breaking the covalent bond or the hydrogen bond? Hydrogen, right? So when I am producing steam, right, it's not these bonds that I'm breaking, because that would be like a boom, right? That'd be a lot of energy release. Well, maybe not that big of a boom, but it would be more energy release. When I boil water and the steam comes out, I'm breaking those bonds and I'm converting water, liquid water into gas, right? Um, and so that's how you um, would, one way that you could break those bonds between the water molecules, okay? Okay, so we're gonna talk about the characteristics that, of water. So again, this is covalent right, sharing of electrons. In this case, it's equal, right, so that would be nonpolar covalent. Okay. So the hydrogen bonding and water gives it the properties of water. Okay. So the first property of water is that it has a high heat of vaporization. And so vaporization just means going from a liquid to a gas. The reason why it has a high heat of vaporization is because of hydrogen bonding. If you think about alcohol, so think about rubbing alcohol. If you leave the cap off the rubbing alcohol bottle, it's going to evaporate, right? So liquid, the alcohol, the rubbing alcohol, has a low heat of vaporization. It is just going to automatically vaporize, right? So this is why, in terms of water, 
This is why water is so important, is because it stays in a liquid form more readily than other liquids do. So for example, we have the significance, so I'll put significance of this, is, is that we have liquid forms of water on the planet. Right? It doesn't evaporate all that readily. It will eventually, right? Sunlight evaporates it. And actually, that's a really important part of the water cycle. As the um, sun heats up the ocean, water evaporates and forms clouds and it moves over the continents and it rains, and then that whole cycle occurs again. But it doesn't evaporate nearly as readily as other liquids. Okay. The other significance of this, of the high heat of, of, vapor, of vaporization, is it can be used for cooling. Specifically, can be used for evaporative cooling. And so this is why we sweat. Okay. And humans, interestingly, have a lot more sweat glands than a lot of other mammals. I'm always, um, I'm just amazed that the kangaroos do not have any sweat glands. Dogs don't either, but they can't. Kangaroos don't have any sweat glands, and so their solution to cooling hot when they're too hot is they will actually lick their wrists. And their wrists have a really thin skin and lots of blood vessels that come to them, and they don't even actually have hair on them. And so they just like, imagine if you had to, in order to cool off, you had to constantly lick your wrists and go like this, right? Probably maybe have done that when you've been so hot that you had to put your hands underneath cold water, right? Your wrists and your legs and your ankles and stuff under cold water to cool off really fast. But uh, kangaroos, that's how they use, you know, they don't sweat, they just sit onto their wrists to cool and evaporate. Okay, dogs can't, but a lot of evaporation occurs over the surface of their tongue, right? Because they can't sweat. Okay, so that's the high heat of vaporization. The second one is, is that it is more dense as a solid, no, excuse me, as a liquid, sorry, as a liquid than a solid, okay? So, You've all experienced, or maybe you haven't, but if you put stuff in the freezer, like bottles or cans of water, so like say you want to want to cool off your soda pop, you put it into the freezer, and what happens is, is that as it goes from a liquid to a solid, there's lots of water in there, and it expands, right? And so ice is is expands, but it also floats. Right? So ice floats. So what that means in terms of our ecosystems and our planet, it means that bodies of water freeze from the top down, not from the bottom up. Okay. So water, um, bodies of water like lakes and streams and rivers freeze from the top down. And they actually insulate, ice insulates the water. And so that means that generally a lot of a lot of places do not freeze solid. So if you think about a lake, it might even have a couple feet of ice on top of it, but below that there's life, right? So things can go on living down here. Imagine if the if it froze and then the ice sunk to the bottom, then it would freeze from the bottom hot, right? And it wouldn't insulate. And so the whole lake would be solid, and so life could not probably, most, most of life, living things could not survive in that um, environment. So um, this means that bodies of water do not freeze solid, right? So even the river, you know, you can see water running underneath the ice, and things are still alive down there. Okay. Okay. So I'm a little bit ahead of myself. Properties of water continued, okay? The third thing is, is that water molecules are cohesive 
and adhesive. Okay, so cohesive means that they stick together and adhesive means that they stick to other things, okay? So I'm gonna show you a little video that talks about specifically about water and its ability to be cohesive and adhesive at the same time. Okay, skip back. Imagine an earth without water, life without water. We find it everywhere, in the atmosphere and below our feet. Three quarters of the earth's surface is covered by this essential liquid. It's a difficult thing to imagine life without water because our own survival depends on it. In fact, water is vital to the existence of all forms of life on earth. Water, or H2O, is an unusual compound with amazing properties. These unique properties are what make it so important to life. First of all, water happens to be the only substance on Earth that can be found naturally in all three states, as a solid, a liquid, and a gas. It is rare in that it actually expands as a solid, which is why ice can float. Pure water is essentially colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Water has a neutral pH, which means it is neither acidic nor basic. Water has been called a universal solvent because it can dissolve many substances. Wherever water goes, either through the atmosphere, the earth, or through our bodies, it takes along valuable chemicals, minerals, and nutrients. This is one reason why water accounts for about 70% of the weight of a cell, which is the building block of life. Water has high specific heat, which means it absorbs a lot of heat before it changes temperature. This is why water makes a great coolant. This is also why oceans, lakes, and water vapor in the atmosphere help to regulate the Earth's temperature. Water molecules are sticky. They attract to each other, which is why water tends to flow together, fall as raindrops, and beat up on the surface of a leaf. This property is the result of cohesion. To understand cohesion, let's imagine we're recreating a water molecule. A water molecule is made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Because of the molecule's arrangement, and the electronegativity difference between the hydrogen atoms and the oxygen atom, the molecule becomes polar. The oxygen atom has a negative charge, while the hydrogen atoms have a positive charge. Since we all know opposites attract, the oxygen atom will stick to a nearby hydrogen atom. The result is a strong bond. Surface tension is a result of cohesion and is the measure of how difficult it is to break the surface of a liquid. We can observe the high surface tension of water by watching this mosquito step onto its surface, or this insect as it struggles to free itself from a droplet. Surface tension is also what causes a water droplet to take a spherical shape. Water is the most cohesive of all non-metallic liquids. Adhesion is similar to cohesion, but refers to two different surfaces or molecules with an attraction to one another. This is why the droplet sticks to this leaf. Along with cohesion, adhesion is responsible for a phenomenon called capillary action. Capillary action is the force that pulls water upward against gravity through a narrow tube. This is an essential property for plants which rely on capillary action to pull water from their roots up to their leaves. So it's pretty obvious that water is important stuff. Humans rely on it for personal consumption, as well as things like industry, energy production, 
and agriculture. But we sometimes have a tendency to use more than we need and pollute what's left. We need to make sure we keep it pure and plentiful. Okay. So cohesion is where the molecules, water molecules, adhere to one another. Adhesion explains how the water molecules can move through and adhere to like the inside of a tube, like say for example our blood vessels, or maybe a, even a straw, you can see capillary action sometimes. If you put straw in water, it'll kind of go up the surface of the straw because it is adhered to it. Okay. okay. The last one I want to talk about is that, oops, four, that water is the universal solvent. Okay. So if we look at a solution of anything, a solution has two components to it. It has the solvent plus the solute. Now sometimes the solvent is oil-based, like an oil-based paint, right? So the pigment is in oil. But in our bodies, the solvent is always water, right? So that's what we use to carry substances in solution. So when I talk about like glucose in your blood, it is in solution. When we talk about sodium ions or chloride ions, these are sometimes called electrolytes, right? Those are in solution um, in your body. Also our hormones, enzymes, antibodies, right, et cetera. All those things that are transported in our body are transported in solution. So think about your blood as a solution that is filled with water and all these other things that are being transported through the body. And it is a solvent because it tends to pull molecules away from one another because of its polar nature. It will pull them away, like we talked about with sodium chloride. It pulls them apart and then things dissolve, right? So uh, substances will dissolve in water, right? So substances will dissolve in water due to its polar water, due to water's polar nature. Okay. Not all substances. So like when we, when we get to lipids, we talk about fats and um, other things in our body, fats do not dissolve readily in water and they have to be transported um, in a different form because of that. Okay, so let's stop there. So remember, you wanna do your first homework quiz, which is due by midnight on Sunday. Okay, so that is through Canvas. Also, um, if you did come to lab on Monday, try to come to lab today. So are you guys leaving? Yeah. So other if you're other than those people that are going to a game. So if you haven't come to lab yet, please come to lab today at two. The lab is downstairs in ST 115.